every day another door closes, but a new one opens again. Whoa, every way we travel must end, but there another road begins. Whatever you've seen. Thanks again for uh, braving the cold weather. And uh, we've been losing a few people, but uh, they have pretty good excuses. I guess I'd better start with a word from our sponsor. I'm going to teach another couple classes. One is um, about the body songs, which is a series of films that I did about the sacred flesh. It's about what happens to the value of the body in a capitalist world where everything is for sale and our bodies sort of get sucked up into this into this process and uh, so I started creating these films gosh years and years ago and I've done quite a few of them and anyway the class is built about about uh, the the idea of how do we evaluate our bodies and how do we protect the sacred nature of our flesh in the capitalist world. And that starts in the end of uh, January, I believe. And it'll probably be at the Myrna. We haven't set that yet. And I've also got a couple of shows coming up. One's going to be the Dancing World paintings that'll be here in the studio in the second weekend of December. There's about 50 of those paintings. So we've been trying to to cram through a whole bunch of material. This is like a whole semester's course crammed into these few weeks. So there's a whole bunch of stuff I didn't get to, and I'm sorry about that. But what I'm going to try to do, uh, I, I ask people to bring drawings to get critiqued, and we may, we may not be able to get to that. But if you can stay afterwards, maybe we can do that. But let me just kind of cram through some stuff that, that I think is really important. And... This is, since it's our last class, you know, if you have any questions about anything, here's your chance to have, to have some halfway decent answers. One thing I wanted to mention was, you know, we've been arranging these classes, so it's kind of like this exercise where we're going through the entire building, you know, getting closer and closer to the figure as we're thinking about the process of doing the drawing. And now, psychologically anyway, I'm feeling like I'm at the end of my drawing. It's sitting on the table around my easel, and I'm trying to evaluate it. And so the one thing I wanted to give you is what I call the emergency kit for disaster relief, which is, which is when you've got your drawing, and you want to kind of figure out if it's, if it's going to pass. Uh, and I, it's hard for me to sort of uh, generalize this because, of course, I'm working from my own perspective. And there are certain things that I want to see in my own drawings. And here's where individuals depart because we all want different things from our drawing. So what I tend to do is I look at the drawing and the first thing I think is, is the gesture right? And the gesture is sort of that, that first uh, glimpse that you have of the figure from a distance. So if it's a standing figure, you know, there isn't a whole lot of gesture. But if there's a little bit of movement, then the gesture is going to be that S curve for running or laying down or any kind of stretching, twisting. I look for that gesture because that's going to be kind of the central theme of the drawing. And then, is the orientation to the earth right? So, like, is the weight from the center of the head distributed on the supporting foot? Uh, and sometimes if the, you know, if the drawing's a little off like this, it's just you, your mind cannot let go of it. It always looks a little <laughs> off, and, and you have to, you know, rearrange the molding in the room to make it straight. <laughs> And then I say, is the proportion right? Is the, the, the length of the 
uh, legs and the arms, the proper length is, are all the internal measurements in good order. Does the spine hold those three major elements together in a symmetrical form? So oftentimes what happens in a drawing is, is everything's in the right pl place, but part of the figure will be sort of enlarged, like one shoulder. And so one of the things I look for is that symmetricality. And even if it's foreshortened, you should be able to, in your head, make those determinations of are the, are the measurements right. And then um, if you've still got your model there, if this isn't three weeks later, which it usually is for me, does, does the, the internal measurements of the model's pose match what you've got going here. We talked about this last week, the angles, the, the measurements between the parts. Uh, is the comparative thickness of the flesh right? So if you have one leg that's, that's really meaty and beautiful and the other one is really thin, that, that kind of thing. Um, the line quality, does it look tentative or does it really sing? And we'll talk a little bit about that tonight, because the, that's one thing that really kind of separates the masters is the quality of the line. Because one of the things that beginning drawers almost always do is, you know, kind of attack the line holding the very end of the sword. So there's not a lot, lot of devotion. And you can feel that devotion. If you use your arm and you, you make a declarative statement of where the line is going to be, it makes a huge difference. And then, does the drawing have a center of focus? Sometimes that's not important, but, but almost always, a drawing really needs to have a place where your eye settles. And sometimes two or three places where the, you know, the eye goes from the face to the hand to the foot or something like that. Um, that these are usually the things that I think about when I'm evaluating the art. And then I think about the aesthetic qualities. Is there an expressive quality to what I put on the paper? What does the composition feel like? Does it feel balanced? Does it feel like this is a, this is well put together? Uh, is there a value plan? A lot of times I've been really creative with the values because the values themselves become part of the subject. And we'll see a little bit of that as I go through some of these. And again, the line quality. Does it look like the drawing is worked? And if so, work really hard to make the drawing look unworked. So that's a... To me, that's a really important thing because what I tend to do, and I think this is pretty common, is you work on a drawing and the more you work at it, you know, the more labored it looks. What's really hard to do is to, is to take that same drawing and, uh, and do that spontaneously. So sometimes if a drawing looks too worked, I'll get a new piece of paper and I'll draw from the drawing rather than the model to try to get that sense of, of spontaneity because overworking something, there's just no going backwards. We talked a little bit about erasing and that's, that's helpful to, to take a, a drawing and start erasing the lines that, that don't have as much power and you end up with uh, a certain kind of a visual look that I don't mind. I really, I don't mind that look of erased stuff. But it also, uh, if you have this beautiful drawing and, and you know, the hand has been erased several times, it calls attention to that and it just doesn't work. What this whole series of classes has been about is expression. And I haven't really spend a whole lot of time on expression because we've been talking about the kind of the left brain activity of measuring and making sure everything is right. And now at this point when the drawing is done, the expression is really important to me. Uh, and 
I'll read a little thing later on about, about again, the reason why we draw. But for me, as an artist, the expression is the reason why I'm doing this. And so it's really important for me to, to the, for the drawing to say something. And I would say the majority of the stuff I do, it looks fine, you know, I could exhibit it somewhere, but it just doesn't say enough to me. And that's, that's the hardest part for me as a sort of accomplished artist, is keeping the expression in there. And what is that about? It's about following your desire, wherever that is. And there's different ways of approaching this. First of all, how do you feel about what the model presents? And, and I, I've said this a couple times, I'll say it again because it's really important. If you're doing a, a drawing as a work of art, the viewer who looks at it is a lot more interested in you than in the subject. Regardless of how fascinating the subject is, what is important about this drawing is how you felt about it. And it's, it's really kind of hard for people to believe this because you think, well, you know, if I do this perfect illustration of this pose or, or whatever, people will look at it and they'll say, I'm a brilliant artist. Well, what they're likely to do is look at it and say, well, this is a, this is a great drawing, but I can't tell anything from it. Um, what I encourage you to do is put your personality on the page so that we can tell what it is that interests you about what you're looking at. Sometimes that's a form. It, it might be a, a passage of the figure. It could be a line, a movement. I get really excited about the internal movement of the figure. It could be a silhouette, a collection of shadows. There are always passages that, that call attention to themselves. It seems to me that even with a model that, that doesn't have a lot of internal movement, like we had last week, um, overweight people tend to have less internal movement. And for me, it's harder to find something really fascinating to draw because the, there's so much action just going up and down because of the weight of the flesh. And, and I really, just because of my own sculptural kind of sensibility, I really like that internal movement in the figure, figuring out how the, the forms wedge together and, and where, the, where the weight and the energy is and stuff like that. However, having said that, everybody has beautiful passages. And I've, there are, Models I've worked with, I remember one guy that was probably 40 pounds overweight, and, and he had very few markers. And so, you know, he twists like this, and you couldn't tell. <laughs> you say, well, there's an arm sticking out this way, so that must be his, his shoulder. You know, it's just when there's, when there's fewer markers, it's harder to find something to get engaged with. And so uh, I always keep in mind that everybody, everybody, has beautiful passages. It's just a matter of finding where they are. And so uh, sometimes one of my challenges is to go through a, you know, a list of, I'm gonna find 10 beautiful things about this person. Okay, there's number one, there's number two. That's just a way of keeping, keeping, uh, your, keeping in touch with your own desire for putting down the, the drawing. And then there's another sort of a psychological aspect to the approach of the, to the model that I've really been exploring the last 15 years or so that, that is fascinating to me. And that has to do with the layers of meaning in the figure. So the first thing you see in the model is, you know, this is Chester and he lives around the corner and he has a cat and and he's a woodworker, you know, it's, a, it's an individual with a story and a name. And then beyond that is another layer that is this guy as a symbol of his type. So if you've, if you've looked at the drawings of Vincent Van Gogh, he was really fascinated with the worker. 
and he did tons of drawings of guys digging potatoes and and hauling the limes. You know, this is this is the archetype of the worker. Beyond that is another bigger layer that is kind of the story of humanity. There's a pose that you can derive some meaning out of that comes from anywhere in history or any culture. We, we have this, this connect human, the human wonder, the wonder of, of humanity as humans exist in the, in the universe. Sometimes I look at a, at a model and I will see this, this really cosmic vision of something like a god or a goddess. You know, it doesn't seem like a human being. It seems way bigger than that. So these are all things that I, that I work with when I'm presented with the model. And then another aspect of the psychological approach is how do I feel in response to this person? So one thing I did for many, many months is work with models in the dark. So I would have the model come in and there'd be like, a candle in the corner so so that we wouldn't bang into the furniture but but you know I'm, I'm just looking at this big form and you know i've got a crayon on this side and a pencil on this side and i'm sort of drawing like this because i can't see anything but it was just fascinating for me because the model is pre is presenting something that is totally mysterious to me i can barely see the the basic orientation that you see from from halfway across the beach and there's certainly no details here is this mysterious object or this person in my space how do i how do i feel about that so these are all ways of approaching the human figure let me give you a few examples of of different approaches that i'm talking about here so this one in particular, um, you know, it's, it's kind of obvious. I got started with being fascinated with that internal movement. But somewhere along the line, I, I became really fascinated with the lines themselves. And I think what I was working with was the fluffy part of the feather dipped in ink. And so the lines are just really erratic. And I love that quality. Mm -hmm. So the drawing sort of became about that. Here's one. Uh, I think about the focus here because the, the head and the face are just totally absent. And it's, it's the hands that become important. So the focus on the hands brings this whole level of meaning into the drawing that, that really comes from me. It's not that the, you know, that the model was lost in fog. It was that I was interested in those, in those hands. Here's one that's... Uh, that's very very loose it's there's almost no form it's almost all just gestural lines and a little bit of shading just to kind of bring out the form but to me one of the kind of graduate level uh pieces of homework that i try to engage is learning how not to draw learning how to leave stuff out and i brought down this picture because it's a really good example of how effective it is to sometimes leave out a really important part of the drawing. And especially with this kind of pose, where the breasts are sort of the, the center of the whole pose, to leave it out gives a kind of uh, authority to it that I couldn't have guessed otherwise. And I can't remember the circumstances of that, but I remember when I looked at it the second time, thinking, I wonder why I did that. All of a sudden I realized that, hey, that really, you know, that really works. Here's one that's just about the shadows. So the shadows themselves become objects. And I'm spending a lot of time just putting, putting delineation to the form of the values. This one is really about the edges. Uh, some of the edges you can't really see, and some of them are sort of overworked. 
And so there's this symphony between what you, what you can see and what you can't. And you can tell in this one how much the, the lines on the outside of the figure kind of anchor it in a certain way. You have a relationship with that. Or, as I often do, I think of my soul as being feminine. So when I draw a woman, I'm thinking about myself. This is a self-portrait. These are the parts of myself that I've yet to understand. Because the woman is so foreign. She lives inside and I can never see her. So there's that, uh, that magical aspect to, the, to working with a real person that to me is really, really fascinating. Your life is not diminished, it's the start of something new. Listen, hear the story through the end. Every day.